I was the kid taped to the flagpole. Yes, I was that kid. It was easy to see why I had never had a father. I mean, there was certainly a sperm donor somewhere, despite my mother's denials. Men are evil. She has worked for years to remove the evil from my soul and body. So I spent grammar school wearing pedal pushers and flowery blouses to avoid toxic masculinity. Basically, I grew up with a target on my back. My mother was a religious zealot. She tried every religion out there. My grandparents converted from Catholicism to Pentecostalism. However, none of them were rigorous enough for her. She finally founded her own cult, which was a warped combination of serpent handling, the holiness movement, and second works of grace, also known as second blessings. Overlaying all of this was her own kind of feminism. The strange part was that I later found out that my mother merely knew those terms and had no idea what they signified or meant. Not even feminism. She simply made up her own definitions for everything. For example, the second act of grace was a female orgasm. Male orgasms, on the other hand, were not blessings at all, as they were the original sin, resulting in procreation and tiny monsters like me. The devil caused male ejaculations. My mother argued that it was no coincidence that the words sperm in spawn and spawn of hell were so similar. Satan transported his spawn to earth via sperm, and it was only the righteous efforts that limited the male's ability to climax, making it difficult for males to repeat the deed too frequently. Female orgasms, on the other hand, might continue indefinitely, according to my mother, enrolling one after the other. That was the highest manifestation of God's mercy and the reward for the natural state of female purity. A woman might climax repeatedly without concern of conception unless the evil snake from the Garden of Eden was involved. Yes, my mother considered feminism to be synonymous with lesbianism and righteousness. My house was often crowded with overweight, slovenly ladies, either accompanied by a sapphic lover or by a pale, skinny, completely dominant husband. That was my mother's congregation. Her followers were largely women who shared her contempt for masculinity. Later, I learned that they believed that the masculine beast could only be controlled through voluntary castration. When I found that my mother's beliefs were fragile, I became religious as well. You would have also become religious. Were you in my position? I thank God every day for the voluntary aspect of the tenet. As a child, my mother's teaching related to testes, Therefore, I'm sure she would have eliminated my seeds of temptation. Had she not assumed that God had put the optional clause in that tenet as it was, my mother would have made numerous offers during my upbringing, offering enormous things, if I could just agree to a simple procedure. I was scared of physicians as a child and would never agree, even if the pony was quite enticing when I was nine. As it was, my own reverend mother was continuously preaching to me to embrace God and offer my sacrifice at his altar. My mother ordered me to fast and spend nights on my knees praying for God's gift of illumination after I refused. All of this merged into the sorrow of my life, and I had no idea that my situation was different outside of the garments my mother put on me. I assumed everyone spent hours fasting and praying. I recall having friends in kindergarten, at least after I started going. My mother wanted to keep me away from public school, which she saw as a pit of wickedness. The school district required her to send me to school when a concerned neighbor informed them of my existence. I had missed the first part of the school year, so when they sent me, I was already the stranger. Everyone else had overcome their initial nervousness, leaving me as the fearful newcomer. Furthermore, I had never been around another child because my mother had kept me isolated. I'd never had a playmate other than imaginary ones, and they were nothing like the kindergarten students. But soon, classmates reached out, and I discovered the delights of camaraderie, which lasted until kindergarten. While our classroom hours differed from the other grades, we arrived later and departed earlier, and our playground times were distinct from the older children, so we were protected from them. That concluded the first day of first grade. When the older students noticed me, the never-ending mocking began. It was never going to end, and it solidified my status as a pariah, the issue was my mother's attempts to protect me from the dangers of masculinity. She styled my hair, which she refused to cut, into curls Shirley Temple would have approved of. And while mom didn't dress me in gowns, my outfits were the most free-spirited and feminine she could find. She has never bought me jeans. Instead, I was wearing capri pants or pedal pushers. 
I remember believing that all jeans had side zippers. My shirts were girls' blouses in pinks and pastels, my underwear. Let's just say I was already in high school when the topic of boxers or briefs arose. The school understood that this was not the best appearance for me and requested that social services handle my issue. Mrs. Ormock was my caseworker. She was also a deacon in my mother's church. The school was told to mind their own business, since my garments were part of my mother's religious freedom. Nobody at the school cared enough to challenge that. Everyone eventually got used to the little creepy male youngster. I had no idea what a male was until I hit puberty, when it became clear that I wasn't, much to my mother's dismay and terror. By high school, I was able to escape wearing the fancy outfits that my mother had bought for me by scrounging or earning enough money to buy jeans and T-shirts from the local thrift store. A nice woman at the Salvation Army store took pity on me and allowed me buy enough clothes to last a week without wearing anything dirty. I once repaid her compassion by donating all of the clothes I no longer wore to the Army for sale. When my mother found out, she made me kneel, pray, and fast all weekend but she did not replace the outfit. I was allowed to wear the second-hand garments I had purchased for the nasty, manly wardrobe update. Unfortunately, it was too late to help. After years of being shunned, I couldn't fit in or make friends. I was the crazy kid with cooties in elementary school and the freaky male weirdo in high school, rejected even by the actual guy kids. By then, I had given up trying. The shame was too much. Following the Shauna incident, I was barred from partnering in class. That marked the first day of freshman year. Physical science. Shauna and I were assigned as lab partners despite her loud and strident objections. Her kindest comment that day was, I think not with the freak. Then when we got to our lab station, I saw her stool was dirty and decided to brush it off with my hand. Unfortunately, just as she decided to sit down, my hand and her suit came into contact, although only the back of my hand. However, she got up and was extremely vocal about my effort to seize her hand, which she expressed repeatedly. She would continue to tell everyone that I was a pervert for the next three years, until I left that school. My mother's church, with its now infamous castration revelations, as her sermons were called, did nothing to help me escape that image. Parents of my classmates insisted that their children not be forced to associate with me. So no lab partners, no study pals, no team sports, and no gym class. Throughout high school, I sat alone. I worked and lived alone. In fact, my only contact with my classmates was when they bullied me, which happened almost every day. The Salvation Army did not sell undergarments. So, despite the fact that I was unaware of the commando choice, I continued to wear the undergarments that dear old mom had provided for me. I had no idea that boys dressed differently because I was never allowed to participate in gym. I never saw inside the locker room in high school. Deprived at home of that godless tool, like as the television. I never ever seen a Hanes underwear commercial. Unfortunately, one pair of pants I had ordered was several inches too wide at the waist. I kept it fastened with a belt, but it remained baggy and loose. When my books were knocked out of my grasp, which happened virtually every hour, I squatted to grab them. Timmy Shaw, one of my main bullies, noticed the purple nylon underwear poking out from over my jeans. He joyfully pointed it out to the older children. Timmy was on the smaller side and I believe took great pleasure in teasing me because he knew that if I hadn't been there, he would have been at the bottom of the totem pole. It took barely a few seconds for the seniors. He instructed me to drop my jeans down to my ankles, revealing the dark purple panties. I was surrounded by laughing classmates who were pointing at me, bringing out their cell phones and shouting for their friends to come and witness. When I tried to pull up my pants... A senior shoved me in the gut, knocking the air out of my lungs. I ended up lying on the ground in a fetal posture until Mr. Galen, the math teacher, chased everyone to class and took me to the nurse's office to get checked out. It would have appeared like Mr. Garland if he hadn't giggled as he assisted me in pulling up my trousers. That's a good color for you. He had to make a joke about my purple panties. I skipped school for the next three days leaving the house in the morning and wandering through the woods until school ended. The truant officer arrived in the afternoon of the third day and informed my mother that there would be consequences if I didn't return to school the next day. Because my mother had regularly sought to keep me home from school over the years, she was aware that if I continued to be absent, she might face a fine or community service hours. 
She also dreaded losing her welfare benefits. So after a night on my knees, I went back to school. My mother followed me to verify that I left. It was then that I realized a rare act of generosity had occurred inside my locker. I discovered two six-packs of white jockey shorts with a message saying, This is what boys wear. The note was not signed, but I knew someone was being nice to the oddball. I walked straight to a restroom cubicle and changed out of my lime green panties that night. All the panties ended up in the trash, which was my neighbor's. I didn't want my mother to find them at our campsite. School, like the rest of my life, remained environmentally friendly, but at least my bullies were disappointed when they pantsed me only to discover those small ways. Of course, their disappointment did not last long. They simply added my jockey shorts to the mound of clothing around my ankles. Another fantastic day of instruction for Habit Holstein, yeah. That name didn't help much either. Only my mother would think of naming a child after that minor prophet starting in kindergarten. I had to explain the name in the manner that my mother preferred, or she would come to class and explain it for me. I occasionally pondered why I had never considered suicide. Habakkuk was a Judean prophet who questioned why God would punish the degenerate people of duty for their immoral behavior toward the people. God conveyed to a cook that he will eventually punish the Babylonians and free the chosen people if they repented of their sinful ways and turned to righteousness. It was awful enough trying to explain that to the teachers. I tried to limit the explanation of my name to what was mentioned in Habakkuk. However, my mother would find out and show up to explain the true significance and purpose of my name. When you see my mother, she would explain that she was the embodiment of the evil Babylonians, whom God was using to punish his chosen people, who, according to her beliefs, were women. The female people had been seduced in the garden by the snake, who, of course, represented the male penis, leading them into degenerate behavior with the punishment of procreation, as well as the curse of menstruation and children. Menstruation According to my mother, it was named after men's truths, implying that God was using bad humans to chastise the true children of God, womankind. Only when women rejected the snake would God separate humanity and reward the lovely, virtuous female species. This is how my mother explained my name. My lovely mother requested that I explain my name. I bet you don't wonder anymore. I was rejected by my classmates. Things improved around the conclusion of my junior year, when Mrs. Cormack, my social services caseworker, was imprisoned. Mrs. Hallmark apparently misunderstood the situation, believing that her husband had finally agreed to embrace the Lord and have his seeds of temptation removed when he was awakened by his wife, who was pulling down his shorts with a knife in hand. He legitimately freaked out and phoned the cops. His wife was shouting about God's will as they carried her away. Mr. Ormarcus has already packed up and vanished, since Mrs. Hallmark was mom's deacon, and she and her husband were the most generous financial supporters of her religion. My mother thought it was a huge shame. She offered to testify at the deacon's trial, but her lawyer did not believe it would be beneficial. I saw that for several weeks, the male husbands of my mother's other disciples were frightened and exhausted. I don't think any of them were sleeping well anyway. Mrs. or Mark was replaced by Mr. Jameson, who reviewed my file and spoke with the school counselor. He insisted on holding weekly meetings. It took several weeks, but he finally got me to talk about my life, my mother, and my loneliness. I believe he was horrified. He did say that it was a good thing Mrs. Orbach was already in a facility since her treatment of me was unlawful. He thought about it, and after a visit to my mother, during which he instilled dread in her by threatening her with anything from prison to loss of social assistance, he began spending time with me. He was the first father figure in my life. He also introduced me to his brother, a lawyer. In the end, the brothers planned for me to sue social services for the abuse I had endured since childhood. My argument was founded on the fact that their representatives effectively rejected the school's attempts to end my misery. I'm looking for a high six-figure compensation. Mr. Jameson's brother represented me pro gratis, so save for fees, the entire settlement was mine. It also instilled in me a passion of the law courtrooms, and the legal system. Update 1. That settlement permitted me to file for emancipation as a minor. I was free. Mr. Jameson found me an apartment in his building and coached me through everything I needed to know. I'd spent my entire childhood cleaning and cooking for my mother, so I was well prepared for the task. 
He did, however, assist with the establishment of bank accounts and financial investing, referring them to a professional advisor. He taught me how to drive and assisted me in finding my first car. We went shopping, and I ended up with a complete new clothing, as well as contact lenses and braces to correct my crooked teeth and heavy spectacles. However, the first thing I planned to do following freedom was get a haircut. Mr. Jameson escorted me directly from the courtroom to a barber shop. I cried as I watched my curls fall to the floor. The barber lifted his hands and took a step back, wondering whether he had wounded me. No, I stopped. I'm quite happy. I'm quite happy. After years of lengthy hair, my cropped hair stood out. We dropped into a drugstore and purchased some hair gel and a hair dryer. Mr. Jameson demonstrated how much gel to apply and how to shape the hair with the hair dryer to achieve the desired look. I did not recognize the boy. No, the man who stared at me in the mirror. I believe I stood straighter, perhaps for the first time in my life. Mr. Jameson accompanied me to sports events. He introduced me to both jogging and the gym. He enrolled me in a karate class, insisting that a man should know how to defend himself. Furthermore, I needed something to keep me from spending my nights in front of the television, to which I was rapidly getting addicted. It introduced me to a completely new world, one in which people can be happy. He also took me to the Catholic Church. He told me that I had a warped view of God, religion, and our relationship with both. He joined me in CCD classes, which stand for Confraternity of Christian Doctrine and our Roman Catholic Religion Studies. He did not need the classes, but he wanted to be there to assist me learn by providing context and explanation. My upbringing may not have provided, or more likely, my childhood will make it difficult for me to understand. Mr. Jameson's religion was gradually revealed to be far more caring and peaceful than my mother's nasty screeds. He also taught me how to ride a bicycle. My mother had taken away another source of delight from me. Overall, the second half of my senior year provided me with a childhood I had never had before. It was the time when I learned to be a man. Mr. Jameson, or Will, as he later demanded I call him, was a true blessing. It was not all fun and games. It was not always the most comfortable of conversations. But shortly after my 18th birthday, Mr. Jameson sat me down and answered things that had been bothering me for years. I eventually discovered answers to questions that had perplexed me as a child in that public isolation. Mr. Jameson taught me how to be a man. That was my childhood. Below, rejected, ridiculed, and trying to comprehend the masculinity that my mother worked so hard to protect me from. I was freed. Other difficulties were apparent. I was tongue-tied around everybody, including Will. I struggled to communicate myself and was prone to stuttering and lisping, which kept me quiet. Imagine a guy in pedal pushers and a ruffled top who lists in high school, not a pretty picture, helping me interact and correct my speech. Will arrange for me to see a speech therapist. I'm not sure what he had planned, but she quickly corrected my speaking problems. Being an incredibly gorgeous lady also helped me feel more comfortable conversing with ladies. It was fantastic when our sessions lasted longer than I anticipated. I did not object. I was simply delighted to have more opportunities to admire that stunning cleavage. My last class was on my 18th birthday. Again, I'm not sure how much will be arranged for at the start of the class. Mona, the therapist, stated, we need to work on your linguistic skills. Then she stripped and took me to the sofa. She introduced me to sex while we lay there, sweaty and exhausted. She claimed that I was a natural. You really are a linguist. But can I be a linguist? Unfortunately, that was to be my last class, but it definitely raised the bar for graduation celebrations. I never returned to high school. In a clever move, I got into an elite private school for my senior year, it was his alma mater, so he pulled a lot of strings and called in favors to get me admitted. I was still bashful, but I had a good build and a pleasant face, so my shyness was mistaken for a strong, silent personality. Girls invited me to dates and dances without saying much. I'd gotten somewhat popular. I had friends, went to movies and parties, and took girls out to dinner. Suddenly, I was a regular teenager, although an emancipated one. A week before graduation, my mother reappeared in my life. She'd found out where I lived and when Will and I returned home from karate class. She dashed across the street, a knife raised above her head, screaming that God required my purity. I was frozen with fear. It was difficult for me to leave my mother after 18 years. 
Will jumped in front of me, putting himself between me and the heroine while running towards us. Was he risking his life for mine? That thought raced across my numbed brain, but that wasn't to be. Mom rushed out in front of a speeding box truck. I swear I heard a crunch as it struck her. And with that, the primary feminine influence in my life was gone. I had conflicting feelings. My mother had never been a nurturer, but she was my mother. I despised her, but I adored her. Why? Yes. She made my life miserable. But whether I was sick or hurt, she nursed and consoled me. People have said that my mother was evil, but I don't believe so. She was insane and held distorted notions, but she genuinely did believe in them. I don't think she ever meant to hurt anyone, but I know she would have hurt me in the end. But I'm sure somewhere in her mind she believed God had spoken to her. And like Abraham on Mount Moriah, he begged her to sacrifice her son. Aside from the demands of her God, she was always sympathetic to the women in her church, assisting many with abusive relationships or financial difficulties. She was even friendly to men who were asking for aid. My mother had been on welfare for much of my childhood, yet she never hesitated to share money or food with those in need. Yes, she made my life hellish, but regardless of her convictions, I believe she loved me. I persisted on seeing a therapist after seeing my mother's death. I had one meeting with that doctor. She observed that I had never shed a tear at my loss. She talked about Oedipal impulses and suppressed sexuality. The one thing she mentioned that rang true was that my main emotion over my mother's death was relief. I agreed and never returned. Personally, I preferred Mona's approach of therapy over this psychobabble. Well urged that I attend Ivy League colleges and once again pulled strings to get me into his Alma institution. I had an unbelievable four years, but the most spectacular of all were the women, culminating in the goddess Shiva. Update 2. Evil and I met at a fraternity party during my junior year. Will's help and example had substantially contributed to my complete acclimatization and socialization by that point. I was fairly popular, a member of the college chess club and the cycling team. Not as glamorous as being on a real sports team, but it had some cash with some co-eds and a member of one of the better fraternities. Yes, it was Will's fraternity. I was treated as his legacy. But then I met Eva Stokes. She was a year behind me and joined the chess club during her junior year. She was a decent but uninspired player. As our relationship progressed, she acknowledged that she had joined the club solely to meet me. It was flattering, to say the least. However, at the time of that confession, we had already become exclusive. Sex with her was far superior to the fantastic sex I had previously experienced. She was amazing and excited when I realized I couldn't fully meet her requirements. I began a discussion about sharing. I was afraid I would lose her to her frustrations, that her sexual need would lead her to infidelity. Her head snapped up, and she looked at me with panic in her eyes. Are you saying you'd share me, or are you breaking up with me? She grabbed my hand. Her question astonished me. It wasn't until I heard my own words that I realized they were confusing. No, I just shook my head. I do not want to do either. I do not think I could share. The idea of you with someone else tortures me. Just thinking about it makes me angry enough to smash a hole in the wall. I don't want to break up with you either. I know we haven't spoken it, but I was hesitant to take that step. I love you. I want to marry you. Eva's eyes brightened up and she began to grab for me. I stopped her. I know you're often frustrated by my inability to keep up with you, I continued. Most importantly, I want you to be happy. And I don't want to be wounded any more than I already am by losing you. But if you don't think monogamy will work for you, we should break up right now. I don't think my heart can handle it later. Tears streamed down her face. Please do not abandon me. You are all I ever desired. You are more than enough for me. And what if I need more than I have, Ernie? Ernie was her favorite vibrator. Frankly, I've always found it intimidating. I want to marry you too. That is my ultimate wish. That's all I think about. I am yours and only yours forever. She drew me to her, pushing her face against my chest. I overheard her mutter. I informed you that I was a monogamous nymphomaniac. She gazed up at my eyes. Unless you mind, Ernie, of course not. I said. We fell into each other's arms and then into bed. She lay back looking satisfied for once. She inquired whether my proposal was accompanied by a ring. I wondered if saying I wanted to marry her counted as a proposal, and even if it did, I wished it did. 
We went ring shopping the following day and married a week after my graduation. We embarked on a honeymoon and were passionately in love. She had even left Ernie at home, which I had not realized was unusual. Our honeymoon was cut short when Will unexpectedly became unwell. Howard contacted me and advised me not to delay returning home. We hustled, even chartering a private plane, but arrived just hours late. Well, he passed away. Unlike my mother, I wept many tears for Will. He had transformed my life and was the source of all good and joy. To this day, I miss him. He was actually my father in every meaningful sense. As a social worker, I wasn't a wealthy man. He had inherited a house from his parents, and he shared ownership with his brother, Howard. He also had a generously funded 401. K, his brother told me that Will had named me his soul there. I tried to offer Howard my half of the house, claiming that he deserved it because it was a legacy from his parents. He declined my offer, claiming that Will considered me his son and that he, Howard, saw me as his nephew. We were family, and he hoped I'd stay at the family home. Iva and I moved in after Will placed his trust in me. Following the legal exam, I took Iva on a month-long vacation to make up for the honeymoon we missed. I chartered a luxurious schooner and spent a month cruising around the South Pacific. It was glorious. We made love under the southern sky, on quiet beaches, and on the deck of our schooner at anchor while the crew slept. We both felt happy. We returned the tent fit and great in love. Eva had a teaching position lined up at a community college. She could have attended an upscale private high school or a junior college. The high school job paid more, but she stated that she expected to advance higher in college. Furthermore, she considered herself as a college professor rather than a high school teacher. She planned to get a Ph.D. I had paid off all of her student loans and the cost of earning her master's degree. I could easily help her pursue a doctorate. I went to work for Will's brother's company, Jameson Atkins and Fisher. They practiced both commercial and criminal law at Fisher, with Howard focusing on commercial matters with Terrence. They were a small but well-respected firm. It was a good fit, and I worked as an associate for it. I had to wait 12 more weeks for the bar results. I couldn't legally act as a lawyer, but I felt comfortable working in the background on his cases. I wanted the entire Perry Mason experience and was disappointed when we didn't represent any murderers at the time. Most of our instances involved basic assault or minor crimes. Even more disturbing was how frequently they were settled through plea bargains. It took months before I walked inside a courtroom and explained that two factors determined most cases. Was the client likely to be found guilty? Could the client afford to battle in court? Even the matters that the court ordered us to handle on pro gratis tended to be settled. You must comprehend that the majority of our customers are guilty. They tend to be career criminals who are realistic about their possibilities. They'd rather plead down, save the court's time, and serve a third or less of the sentence they'd face if they went to court. So much for Perry Mason. Ed quipped that I should have spent my childhood watching. Let's strike a bargain. Let's hear it from Monty Hall and Wayne Brady. I didn't understand the humor at the time. Eva explained it to me later. While the law proved to be a disappointment, Eva began teaching and fell in love with the experience. She'd come home every day, ecstatic that the students seemed to enjoy her lectures. Her sex urge seemed to increase even more after she started teaching. I had not considered that possibility. When I questioned who was more thankful, men or women, she gave me an odd look and questioned why that mattered. When I said that, they were undoubtedly more appreciative of her face, but she became upset and refused to let me touch her. That was our first quarrel and my first time sleeping on the couch. The next day, I was able to persuade her that I was joking and never intended to disparage her teaching abilities or presentations. I realized how seriously she took her teaching and how much she valued the respect she believed she deserved. Following that, I treaded carefully. When we talked about her profession, Ernie became more present in our bedroom. Eva always arrived home much earlier than I did, and we frequently went to bed together. I could tell Ernie had been with her earlier in the day. I figured it was Ernie. Eva had never given me a reason to suspect her of infidelity. When the bar exam results were finally released, I passed. With a UP score of 320, I not only passed, but also placed in the top 90 percentile. Howard. Ed and Terry were all ecstatic. I was now a full associate with the firm, 
despite being one of just 20. I was still overjoyed. Everyone complimented me on my good score, or so I thought. It took me some time to understand I had lost someone I considered a wonderful friend. Robert Garcia and I frequently ate lunch together and were assigned the same cases. Outside of work, Gloria and Eva had become close friends, and the four of us frequently went out together. I thought we made an excellent team, especially for those who had not yet passed the bar. Bobby had graduated law school the year before me, and while we both took the exam in July, it was mine first time and Bobby's third. After failing the bar twice before, he passed this time. Even today, he barely passed with a score of 265, five points above the needed 260. He arrived at the office, ecstatic that he had passed, but appeared to sour when another associate informed him. Bobby had other plans for lunch, and Gloria had other friends to recount. Eva felt the rejection as deeply as I did, and she demanded to know what I had done to our friends at the time. I had no idea, and when I confronted Bobby, he initially told me that there was nothing wrong. He walked away, leaving me stunned and upset by his words. Another associate witnessed the conversation and told me how poorly he responded to my accomplishment. He's simply jealous, dude. You not only cleared the bar the first time, but you also surpassed all of our scores. You are a star. When I informed Ava what was happening, she didn't believe me. She didn't believe Gloria would abandon her simply because her husband was envious. For the following six months, she refused to read the writing on the wall, sending Gloria invitation after invitation until she gave up. She was heartbroken. Eva was from up north and had never met anyone in my hometown. Gloria had been her closest confidant and companion. They were both teachers in a Christian high school, just like Gloria. My wife was devastated and beyond comfort. Update 3. We eventually connected with folks from the community college, but she was hesitant to associate with anyone from the law firm. I began to take my lunches alone. It reminded me of high school. I felt lonely, which unfortunately led me to isolate myself even more. Then one day I came in and saw the other associates staring at me and snickering. That lasted for a week. Then panties began appearing on my desk. I wasn't sure what to do. When I was giving presentations in front of giggling co-workers, I began to get tongue-tied. Evil laughed at me when I began stuttering at home. When she saw my expression, she took me in her arms and asked what was wrong. I informed her what was going on at work, but she said that everyone was jealous of me and that I should ignore them. My vocal presentation became increasingly ineffective as time passed. Eva lost her patience with me and told me to man up. That was my second night sleeping on the couch. She apologized to me the next morning but said, Really? Heck, this is something only you can solve. Simply get out of your thoughts and everything will fall into place. She was clearly losing respect for me which had an impact on our sexual relationship. She began mocking me during sex, and I would lose my erection, which only gave gasoline to her remarks. She mentioned multiple times that Gloria and Bobby might have kept her satisfied. They're both far more macho than you. Our relationship was rapidly deteriorating, with belittlement occurring both at work and at home. But things only got worse. I missed Will. He would have helped me deal with these issues, my stuttering eventually interfered with the cases I was working on. The clients were having difficulty understanding me. My work started vanishing as well, sometimes misfiled, sometimes lost entirely. Bobby would joke and smile when I felt humiliated in front of a client. I was sure it was him, but I had no proof. Eventually, I was brought into a meeting with the partners, and Howard demanded to know what was going on. I tried to explain my feelings of estrangement, the snickering, and the panties on my desk. I explained how my files went missing or, on occasion, were rebuilt with errors I would never have noticed. In less than two months, I had gone from a celebrity to a stuttering, tongue-tied disgrace. I believed I'd overcome the damage imposed by my mother, but here it was again. I felt like I was back there, bound to the flagpole, which I apparently was. During the conference, Howard's computer was colored with an incoming email, which he opened since it seemed relevant to a current case. His face showed a surprised expression. I could tell he was scrolling through a few photographs. I think I understand what this is about. Hack, you still have friends among the associates, and one has forwarded to me emails that were sent to all of the associates but you. He flipped the laptop around to show me the gallery of images he'd been looking at. They go back several months. Your friend should have sent it to me then. There I was, 
with my Shirley Temple hair nailed on the flagpole. There were images of me wearing those purple panties. There were pictures recording my youth, including what appeared to be videos of my mother preaching from the pulpit. My childhood horror was exposed for everyone to see. I got up and walked out. Howard yelled to me several times, but I didn't stop or dare to return. I was too choked up to stutter. As I exited the office, I noticed Bobby and a few other associates laughing. Perhaps Bobby was the friend who forwarded the emails to Howard, if only to ensure my humiliation in front of the partners. I resigned from the firm that evening. Eva tried to talk me out of it, asking what I planned to do. If I quit, whoever sabotaged me at Jameson, Atkins, and Fisher was most likely to send those photos to any law firm in town, and she was content at the college and didn't want to move to another location again. She told me that I had to man up. What? She muttered as she turned away. Sounded like you, limp dick. I opened my briefcase to get my thermos out to clean, and to my surprise, several pairs of panties fell out, including one the same shade of purple as those in the photos. Evil looked at them and smirked. I should have known, she said. Gloria told me that they cut us out because you were hitting on Bobby. She said that you were probably a latent homosexual. That's probably why you can't keep it up anymore. So much for monogamy. She stormed off and slammed the bedroom door. That was the third night I slept on the couch. I couldn't believe that my wife of over four years would have these thoughts or believe that slander. I know that I had routinely failed to satisfy her, especially lately. But she had to know that I was hetero with all the sex we had had during our time together. I felt alone, more so even than when I was a child. Without even I was lost. My life had seemed perfect, but now it seemed like an illusion. As I went to sleep, I could hear the telltale sounds of Ernie bringing satisfaction to my bride. I woke up in the morning when Iva threw the panties in my face and told me I might as well wear them openly since she knew I was changing into them daily. I was shocked and horrified that she would even think this. I can't stand the frustration you're submitting me to. She pulled on her coat and gloves. I agreed to be monogamous, but it seems you don't want to be. I thought that monogamy also implied that I'd be having some sex. You've turned into a worthless. She smirked at me again, then continued. You know, I targeted you in college. I mean, you've been an emancipated minor and had a lovely bank account. No family to interfere, no trust fund to block me. And the girls talked about how great in bed you were. I don't see it. Never have. You could be great. The first couple of rounds, but you could never last long enough to bring me over the top. Well, at least I got my student loans and masters paid off. Our divorce settlement should cover my PhD. I'm going to be staying with Bobby and Gloria for a while while we work this out. Iva turned and walked out. Turned out she had already packed and loaded her car. I sat there as she peeled off down the street. But she loved me. I thought I couldn't believe that she did. Update for Howard showed up the next day. He refused to accept my resignation. I was family and he needed me in the firm. How can I even show my face? I asked. They all saw me like that. Take the resignation. I was so distracted by my missing Iva. I didn't stutter or lisp at all. Howard sat for a minute, looking at me. You know, when Will first told me about you, he described a child with an unbelievably horrid childhood. He described it as soul-crushing. He doubted that you would ever overcome those terrible experiences, but he was determined to help you. And he was so proud of you, how well you recovered. He bragged about the strength of your being. He laughed fondly at a memory that occurred to him. He described you as Superman, a heroic figure. He called you his son, how proud he was. He stood up, preparing to leave your jobs there for you. You're my nephew. But beyond that, you're the best associate we have. Or you will be with a little more experience. Ed says he'll be in trouble without you. But you understand some of the cases better than he does. You know, the only thing that's changed is that more people know how you suffered as a child. That doesn't change what happened, and it damn sure shouldn't change the man you've become. Take your time and work on your linguistic skills. Mona said to give her a call. He put down a slip of paper with a phone number on it and left. I didn't contact Mona. I didn't go back to work. I sat for three days in Missouri waiting for Iva to return. Phone calls and emails went unanswered. Not just to Iva, but to Gloria and Bobby as well. I was alone.
Finally, the third evening after she left, I drove over to Bobby's house. I was determined to confront my wife. There were lights on in the house, but there was no answer to my knocking. Somebody had to be home. I headed around the side yard. Bobby's and Gloria's house was up on a hill with their back deck and pool overlooking a valley. It offered them privacy. Most of us were denied. As I opened their back gate, I heard sounds of women moaning. I pulled out my phone and looked around the corner. There on the deck was Iva with Bobby. Dot, dot, dot. I knew he was inseminating my monogamous bride. Their climaxes continued as I walked up behind Bobby and planted my size 10 boot between his legs. His new roar disturbed the ladies who looked up to see me follow up with several more kicks at the now prostrate lover. Don't hurt him, Eva cried as both she and Gloria moved to place themselves between us. What? The duck? I demanded. You're my wife. What happened to monogamy? She smirked at me. You gave that up when you went. Why? Besides which, I lied. Eva gave me an evil smile. I took the college job because my friend Ernie is the coach there. We've been screwing since before we married, and I found out that Gloria and Bobby together have no trouble satisfying me. Ernie can fill in at work. I'm not shy. That was just a lie. Bobby's telling. I wasn't sure why. The idea that I was shy was what upset me. Any of his tirade. Ernie threesomes with the Garcias. I suddenly realized that I didn't care anymore. I switched off the phone. I had recording in my hand. You know what? They can have you. I was proud that I neither stuttered nor list. I'll file tomorrow for a divorce. And I think Uncle Howard might have something to say about Bobby's employment after I file for adultery. Naming these two is correspondent Ernie as well. If I find any evidence against him, I looked at my former friend's wife and Gloria works for a church. They might find this video unsettling as well. At least the adulterous lesbian part. Gloria blanched. Bobby just painfully moaned some more. The good news is I'm unemployed. My investments predate our marriage. My inheritance from Will, including our house, is in a trust for me precluding you, and the court is likely to give me some alimony. Since you're the breadwinner in our marriage now, I turned and left. I left by going through the house, figuring it was the shortest way out. As I passed by the open bedroom door, I saw the original Ernie standing proudly on the bedside table. I'd heard and scooped him up. I had plans for him. This new set of humiliations had showed me what had tried to tell me, what Will had seen in me. I had strength of character. I could let it all roll off my back and find a better way to live. That's what Will had taught me. I would let Howard know that I'd be back once my divorce was final. I wanted my wife to be the breadwinner in this marriage when we divorced. With my investments, I might not get alimony, but I could afford to try for it just to torment Iva. And I'd do my damnedest to make sure that she was penniless when the divorce was final. When I got home, I'd close out our credit cards and make sure our accounts were drained. I planned to hound Bobby in court. I'd take the other side of any case he worked on pro bono. I planned to humiliate him until no decent law firm would hire him. And, Gloria, I think that luring her away from Bobby with the most beautiful women I can hire to act as her lover, only to be dumped by them once her marriage was toast, would be a punishment for both the Garcias. Besides, I didn't have any hard feelings towards Gloria except those that were sure to arise when I watched the video. I take Gloria in the end was really something to see. I sent my video to the cloud and went home to do two things, introduce Ernie to my barbecue and find that paper with Mona's phone number. She was only five years older than I was. I think I needed another graduation ceremony. This could be fun. Update 5. Habakkuk gets his revenge. The door was opened by the most beautiful and delicate little girl Habakkuk had ever seen. She stared up at him with a visage of intense concentration. May I help you, sir? The little lady asked, formally packed, knelt down in front of her, bringing the might of eye. Possibly, Hack began, are you the lady of the house? The girl gave him that look that all little girls seemed to master. Young one that said, are you nuts, mister? Before turning and yelling into the house. Ma'am, some man's at the door. As Habakkuk stood up, the adult version of the little lady pulled the door fully open. Can I help you? She asked suspiciously. Hack had thought that Eva was beautiful, that Gloria was sexy. Here was a woman. He thought that put a light to both those thoughts. He realized that he was staring and tried to focus. Are you Meredith Larkin? 
said Hack as he offered his card to the lady. The look of panic widened the woman's eyes as she looked at the card. The words attorney at law seemed to leap up at her. She hesitantly replied in the affirmative. What is this about? she asked with trepidation. Habakkuk could feel the fear that was overtaking the woman and tried to be as reassuring as possible. I'm not here to add to your problems, he told her. In fact, I'm hoping that you will let me help you. He gave her his brightest smile. What do you mean? she asked cautiously. Well, as you can see from my card, I'm an attorney. You're being sued by your former neighbor and tenant for adverse possession of your property. I'd like to represent you in that case. As she shook her head and began to close the door, hack at it pro bono. Of course, the closing door paused and then reopened. Why? Why would you do that? Letting his smile be, he responded, That's a fair question, but a long answer. Maybe we could sit down while we discuss it, either in the house or out here on the porch, still suspicious. Meredith agreed to sit on the porch, unbending enough to offer Hack a coffee, which he accepted once she had returned with the drinks. Hack launched into his story. The lead attorney on the plaintiff's side is a former friend named Robert Garcia. I vowed to destroy him in court. In every case, he appears in order to which he is connected. That's really the long and short of it. Why, again, why would you do that? What's he done to you? Meredith wondered how honest a vengeful man would be. Have a cook. Sat quiet for a moment. Then he said, I can understand your suspicions and I can tell that you're going to ask why until I've told the whole story. He sipped his coffee. Did you grow up around here? He asked when she replied that she had. He inquired, have you ever heard of Rita Mason? The feminist church? Meredith's face lit up in recognition. The castration revelations. She laughed, though. God, I remembered that that woman was nuts. Hack looked down. She was my mother. Meredith's face fell. God, I apologize. Hack mumbled that she wasn't as sorry as he was. But wait, she questioned. Your card says her last name is Jameson, not Mason. I adopted the name of the man who helped me escape the hell my mother raised me. He was my social worker. Hack began his storytelling of the steps his mother had taken to save him from toxic masculinity. About how she viewed him as the spawn of, say, your own mother, Meredith whispered sympathetically. How horrible. Hack her through his life. The humiliations of childhood. The salvation afforded by Mr. Jameson being an emancipated minor college. Even in his marriage... He left out the plastic and real earnings. It was a bit much to tell a stranger law school, while Iva got her master's and the jealousy of Bobby and the destruction of his marriage. And she never loved you? Meredith murmured thoughtfully. So Hack summed up. I tried to raise above it. I'm not a violent man, but I can't be attacked and let it stand. So I opposed Bobby in court, offering him the humiliation that will bother him the most. So far, he hasn't been in the courtroom. But when I find out he associated with the case... I make it my business to help the other side. I haven't won every time, but that's because I've basically been on the sidelines. The lawyers don't seem to like me butting it, even if it's to help. He shrugged. But this time, he's going to court. And I've heard that you haven't gotten a lawyer yet. Why is that? He looked at the woman seeing a sadness settle on her face. Money. Why else? She picked up a napkin she brought out with the coffee and dabbed her eyes. When my husband died... We had more debt than savings and working two jobs. I just make enough to keep up with the bills. I can't afford a lawyer. Here, the woman broke down and sobbed openly. The frustrations of the last year overwhelming her. The little girl who had been listening through the window threw open the door and ran into her mother's arms, hugging her fiercely. Habakkuk silently vowed to save this woman and child. Whatever it took, the divorce had been finalized in the last month. Habakkuk had held off his revenge until the divorce and the financial decisions had been made as he suspected. His trust in investments made the court deny him spousal support, even though he was unemployed and his wife still had her job. But the tape of his wife sneering as she told him how she had targeted him in college for his money had him pay for her education, including student loans and plan to fund her Ph.D. when she raped him in divorce court. Convinced the judge that what they had come into the marriage with was what they should take out of it. His investments remained. His IVA was as penniless now as she had been in college, although she retained her retirement from the school district. 
PAC had no claims on her income or benefits. On the other hand, she had no claims on his house, so she continued to live with the Garcias. She bragged about how good the sex was in every face-to-face -face meeting they had with their lawyers. She also let Hack know that she was even bringing the real human journey home, since Hack had destroyed her plastic Ernie toy that actually pleased Hack, since she had made the mistake of bringing him in before the divorce papers were actually file-allowing Hack's P.I. to gather evidence. The divorce filing was amended to include Ernest Johnson as one of the adulterous partners. The only revenge that he had begun was against his old pal Bobby. Robert Garcia had been fired immediately from James Atkins and Fisher once it was determined that he was the source of the emails outing Hack and his childhood traumas. He had finally been hired as a junior associate by an ambulance chasing firm. Stiller and Mayer's Hack, still technically unemployed, although he had helped Ed Fisher with some of the criminal case behind the scenes, an unpaid offered his service pro bono to the company being sued by Stiller and Mayers if Bobby was assigned to the case, a clerk at the firm was willing for a fee to keep Jack appraised of Garcia's workload while Hack was working alone. Howard Jameson was happy to offer Hack the services his firm could offer in support. That help was considerable. Update 6 Hack had succeeded in successfully defending the company in all the cases he became involved in. Two companies rejected his offer, and several more times he was rejected by the company's law firm, even though his services would have been free. When Stiller and Mayers finally realized that Hack, Jameson, had been instrumental in their defeat, they had approached him with an offer of employment. He had laughed and rejected their first and all subsequent offers. When they learned that he was acting as an unpaid agent, they finally questioned why. When learning that they were being targeted because of Garcia, they made an offer. He accepted he wouldn't work unpaid against them if they released Bobby from their employment. He did reserve the right to go against them with any paying clients. One of the law firms that had twice refused his assistance was Drummond Dodge. Subsequently, they lost both cases, each with not only enormous judgments, but added punitive damages. The companies each of whom had wanted to accept, have a Cox offer, but had given in to the law firm's refusal, had each subsequently fired Stroman. Deutsch. The law firm blamed their dismissal on Hack and were only too happy to hire Garcia. Unlike Stiller and Mayers, Sandy were a highly professional and well-respected group of lawyers. Their clients were huge firms who paid six- and seven-figure retainer fees every year, above the actual cost of Sandy's legal services. Still, the loss of a client stung, and they looked forward to humiliating Hack in court as punishment. Garcia was relegated to the position of paralegal. While the powers that be looked for a case that wouldn't endanger their large accounts, the case against Meredith Larkin fit the bill perfectly. The client wasn't one of their corporate clients, but instead was the cousin of one of the senior partners. The case was being done as a favor to the cousin who was trying to acquire Meredith's property for herself. Bobby was overjoyed to be finally assigned a case and his Lee to boot. Finally, he would be able to show his bosses what a great lawyer he could be. His confidence waned when two junior partners were added as associate counsel, and it soon became clear that Garcia was only lead on paper. Gloria Garcia was put out. It had been fun at first when Bobby and she were taking over to bed, and she had even looked forward to Ernie joining the fun. But the reality soon became apparent. Bobby and Ernie were ducking even, and if she was lucky, they let her clean up the mess when they were done. Sure, they'd give her a toss occasionally, but Iva was clearly the main event. Gloria was in second place in her own home. Second place was an unfamiliar experience for her. Each night her resentment built so, on several Friday nights, she had made the excuse that she was going out with some girls from work and then would head to Sappho, her favorite bar to HL with men. That night, she downed her first shot of tequila quickly, then signaled the barkeeper while scanning the room. She was surprised to see a familiar face, one that lit up when they locked their eyes. It was Regina, one of her junior class students from two years ago. Regina smiled broadly, coming up to Gloria. Mrs. Garcia, my favorite teacher. Regina kiss on Gloria's cheek, Gloria remembered. Regina. Well, Gloria had had dreams about the girl she hadn't known, but she swung in Gloria's direction. Call me Gloria. Regina, you're not my student anymore. 
Gloria patted the stool beside her and Regina happily. Sit down, Gloria, I've got to tell you I've always had the biggest crush on you. You were the sexiest teacher at San Boniface. She laughed. Of course, the competition wasn't much considering how many teachers were dried up old nuts. Gloria ran her finger down Regina's cheeks and over her lips. Do you still have that crush? You're 18 now, aren't you? She asked huskily, lust pumping through her veins. Dreams do come true. My sister's out tonight. We'd have the house to ourselves. Regina tilted her head and raised her eyebrows with the unspoken question. Let's go. Gloria didn't have to think twice. Their affair lasted exactly two Fridays the second week. Gloria went directly to Regina's house and was soon scissoring with the young woman. Right at their climax, the bedroom door swung open, revealing Regina's sister Ronnie and the camera in her hand. Gloria jumped up, pulling the sheet off the bed to cover herself. Stop that filming. You've got to erase that now, she demanded. Ronnie laughed and said, Sure, no sweat. I wasn't really filming. I'm just fucking with you. She looked surprisingly at the teacher. But, Mrs. Garcia, you look good enough to eat. How about making this a sister act? Gloria smiled and dropped the sheet. Ronnie was a different ball of wax, a much more exciting version than her sister. Tattoos and piercings adorned the body of the woman that was rumored to be the head of the Twisted Sisters, a less motorcycle gang. This would be a whole new experience. When Ralph died, Meredith began. I was a wreck. It was just Ruby and I kissing the girl on her lap as she related her story to Hack. Ralph had no family, and neither did I, and he had handled all the bills and savings. I'm hopeless at those things. So when Martha, my neighbor, came over to help, I thought she was a lifesaver. Ruby wasn't even one year old at the time, and I was overwhelmed. Ralph had been proud to have me as a homemaker. I'd never worked outside the house, so raising Ruby and making a home for my family was to be my only job. But when Ralph's cancer manifested and suddenly she stopped and hugged Ruby as another sob escaped. Suddenly Ralph was gone, and so was our income. I thought he had a life insurance policy, but I could never find it. Martha seemed so helpful. She straightened out my mail, babysat Ruby while I went to work first at McDuffie Burgers, then to a second job at Price Coke, just to earn enough money to keep the roof over our head and food on the table. The real problem started when Martha suggested that she move in, that it would be easier to take care of Ruby without having to go back and forth between houses. When I worked night stocking at Price Coke, she could go to sleep in the guest room. It seemed to make sense, and she was being so helpful. I agreed. We actually became a family. I thought then when the tax bill came, she paid it before I even saw it. She said that she knew I didn't have the ready cash. I was just starting to work. So it took several months for me to earn enough extra cash to pay her back. I even had to sell some of my jewelry to raise enough money. Then she asked for it in cash. She said it would save her a trip to the bank. She laughed ruefully. Save her a trip to the bank? What pulls each tie? Let me guess, Hack interrupted. Good old Martha is living here and paying the taxes. She probably worked a way to pay them the next few years as well, didn't she? Just saving you the trouble and you paid her back in cash. Meredith nodded sadly. The lawyer looked at Ruby. You're a big girl, aren't you, sweetie? Let me guess. I bet you're five, aren't you? The little girl smiled proudly and nodded. Five years. Martha is claiming adverse possession, isn't she? She's lived here and paid the taxes for five years. And you never objected? He shakes his head. I never had a chance to object. I was out working all day and she got the mail. The first I would hear of the taxes was when Martha would ask me to reimburse her. She wiped her eyes. I thought we were a family. She had been so helpful. I never realized that she moved in with me because she rented next door. She moved in to save that rent money. But I was grateful that she was so helpful with Ruby. It felt like a fair exchange. Well, California has a five-year period before you can claim adverse possession. Martha obviously knew that and targeted you. The challenge will be proving that you repaid her for the taxes. It's undeniable that she's resided here for those five years, and I'm sure she has checks to show she paid the tax. She nodded, he continued, and she arranged that you have no way to show that you paid her back. Cash usually leaves no traces. Hopefully she made a mistake and deposited your cash into her account. If we can subpoena her bank records, we'll have a case. Without that, it's going to be tough. Meredith snaffled, I don't know what I'm going to do. I managed to get Martha out of the house, but I can't afford to change the locks, and she still has her keys and I can't go to work. I have nowhere to leave Ruby. He pulled out his phone as he smiled at the distressed woman. 
We can fix all that. As he called a locksmith, she objected, saying that she couldn't allow him to do that, that she wouldn't be able to pay him back. He held up his hand to stop her objections while he gave instructions to the locksmith who promised to come right out. When he hung up, he told her that she didn't have to pay him back, that he just wanted her to be safe. When she still objected, he thought he understood. Look, people helped me. People who didn't have to help me paid for things and won. His eyes stared at the memories. One very special man left me his estate. Believe me, this is no problem. And if you think I'm another Martha looking to take advantage of you, somehow I'm happy to write up an agreement that will state one. I'm taking your case pro bono, with all costs and expenses being solely on me, and to your safety. And rubies are considered an important part of the case, and so will be insured at my sole cost. He smiled as he called up Rosa, who had been his paralegal at jail, and she was a mid-fifties Hispanic woman who had eight children, the youngest only ten. I explained Meredith's childcare problems and asked how she handled hers. Fifteen minutes later, the agency she used had promised to send over several potential sitters over the next day for Meredith's approval. Meredith was weeping, now in frustration, saying she couldn't pay for this. Okay, offered her back. I'll tell you what, we'll counter sue Martha and you can pay me back from the proceeds when we win. What if we don't, she asked. That's my worry. Not. I'm happy you'll be able to return to work and Ruby will be cared for. Isn't that what we're hoping for? The argument was tabled by the arrival of the locksmith. Two hours later, the locks were all changed and Hack took his leave with the locksmith, promising to return for the child care interviews. Update 7 Eva and Ernie found themselves out of a job as pictures of their relationship, and that of Yvette's and the Garcias were provided to the school board. The photos hacks they had obtained with a camera hidden in the classroom supply closet of the pair ducking at work were enough. The other photos turned out to be gratuitously overkill. However, the male board members appreciated the overkill. Gloria was glorious, as was Eva, as secretly did a few of the female members. When Iva was informed that the reasons for her dismissal would be included in any recommendation package the school was asked to provide. She realized her career in education, which she had enjoyed, was probably over. On top of that, she would never be able to afford her Ph.D. Ernie, the idiot, tried to console her by suggesting they retire to his house for someone on one comfort as she angrily pushed Ernie away. She cursed him and told him they were through, that she never wanted to see him again. She also cursed her ex-husband and vowed vengeance. It was bad enough that she had lost everything in her divorce, had lost the lifestyle that her husband's wealth had provided. She was aware that she had provided her husband with the ammunition he needed when she stupidly revealed that she had used him, had married him solely for her financial advantage. But still, the asshole didn't have to be so vindictive. Thank God the Garcias were still willing to provide her shelter. She didn't have enough money for her own place. She wondered how she could cement her relationship with Bobby. He'd finally gotten a job with a great law firm. Not like the ambulance chaser firm Hack had gotten him fired from again. He didn't have to be so demon vindictive. But now that Bobby was with an even better firm than Jameson, Atkins, and Fisher, maybe he could finance her Ph.D. Then he could find a college to work at. She would just not mention teaching at the high school and never have to ask for a recommendation. Hack stopped Gloria in the parking lot as she was leaving school. She almost ran back inside when she saw him, knowing how he had gone after his wife and her husband. She dreaded what he would do to her. He had threatened her job the night he had caught them all, but hadn't yet followed through. Hey, Gloria, I've got a film to show you. Hack held up an iPad. It shows you making love to one of your students, an underage student. That never happened. I won't do that, Gloria hissed, looking around to see if anyone was near enough to hear. No one was. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Let's watch the video. He hit play. The picture started up in the living room of Regina's and Ronnie's house. As the camera started up, it flashed across a newspaper on the table. A TV news program was playing on the TV in the background. The camera moved through the house. Noises of sexual play clearly heard over the TV as the door to the bedroom opened. There was Regina and Gloria cavorting on the bed. Gloria jumped up, pulling the sheets around her, demanding the camera be turned off and the video erased. The film stopped. Gloria smiled smugly. She's not my student anymore, and she's not underage. No, 
This video is over two years old, and Regina wasn't even 16 yet, Hack insisted. No, no, that was last week, and Regina is over 18 and not a student. Gloria panicked, forgetting to keep her voice down. I think maybe you should watch the video more closely, the newspaper on the counter, from a day two years ago. The newscast on the TV from that same day, and Regina and Ronnie will both testify. It was two years ago. Hack tossed and shook his head. Did you see any tattoos on Regina's body? She's gotten several in the last year. None of them were showing in the video. She must have covered them. She must have. Gloria was panting now with a growing fear. You know, not only will this get you fired and banned from teaching, but the lawyer shook his head again. Regretfully, the police and the DA take cases of teacher-student very seriously. The student part isn't too bad. In the last case, the teacher only got a 180-day sentence. But the statutory part of your crime, that's easily good for two to twenty years. No, it didn't happen. You can't use that tape, Gloria pleaded. Yes, I can, he stated as he smiled smugly. Of course I won't. If you're willing to work with me, as Gloria agreed to, she insisted. He looked over her body. He'd watched the video of her, his wife, and Bobby several times, and she was a sight to behold. Before his plans for vengeance, he intended to enjoy some sessions with this bishop. He had had several graduation ceremonies with Mona right after his marriage had fallen apart. But Mona had since fallen for a kindred spirit and got married. It had been a long spell since then, and how could think of several things he wanted to do with Gloria? Then there was his vengeance against Bobby and his wife to consider and he wanted to give his pie a reward, and maybe a few other people who Gloria might not like so much, but he could insist on. And there were. The sisters had called Ronnie to tell her how well everything had worked out, and to thank her and Regina again for their help. Ronnie brushed off his thanks. Hey, dude, you've bailed the Twisted Sisters out several times, all pro bono. We were happy to help you out. Hack made a mental note to add the sisters to the list of favors Gloria was going to have to provide. Update Bobby assured Martha that they had a lock on the case. They could prove beyond a doubt that Martha had resided for more than five years in the house and had paid the property taxes on her own. And without objection from Meredith Larkin for those five years, it was open and shut. So strong was their case that the two junior partners had stepped back from the case, telling Bobby that they were sure that even he couldn't screw it up. Bobby didn't mention that sentiment to Martha as they smugly smiled at each other. Discovery had allowed Hack's forensic accountant to examine her bank accounts, which clearly showed the taxes being paid out. But there were no deposits restoring that money to Martha's accounts. Hack was stumped. The facts seemed to line up against Meredith. Hack believed her version of events, but was at a loss at how to prove the truth to the court. It was his P.I. who saved the day. He was so appreciative of the weekly gift the hack had bestowed upon him, the weekly gift of the glorious Gloria, that he spent time and money to illegally bug Robert's office and the apartment that Martha had moved into. Lo and behold, when pressed by Bobby, Martha admitted to having a secret investment account where the tax reimbursements had been deposited. Hack would be able to get access to that hidden account. It would also be harmful to Martha's case. When the judge found out that she and her counsel had hidden the account, Hack would have to find legal way of discovering the account where Garcia's knowledge of it could be established. But a bonus occurred during Martha's meeting with Bobby. She stated that Ralph Larkin had had an insurance policy with YZ Insurance Company, which Meredith had never cashed in. Martha had all the correspondence from the insurance company and wanted Bobby to find a way she could make a claim on it. To her disappointment, Bobby failed to think of any scenario where Martha could make a claim on her then-neighbor's life insurance. But as Meredith's lawyer had contacted XYZ that day, establishing that Ralph had had a $2 million policy, which he had established before his marriage, XYZ confirmed that the premiums had been paid until five years ago, when the premiums began being deducted from the cash value of the policy— they informed Mac that the cash value would be depleted before year's end, and then the policy would lapse. But we've informed Mr. Larkin by correspondence of all this. Why are you asking the represented have queried Hack informed them that Ralph had died five years previously and that the account had been illegally hidden from the widow? When the company representative objected, the lawyer assured them that he didn't suspect and wouldn't accuse the insurance company of any wrongdoing. Quite the opposite. He was sure that they had acted honorably, 
and the illegalities had been done by a third party. However, he informed the representative that Meredith would be making a claim based on her husband's death five years prior. Next, he called Rosa and asked her to call several banks and investment firms to find out if Martha had any accounts with them. The list he sent, Rosa, included the firm Martha had revealed to Bobby. When Rosa reported that Martha had accounts not only at that investment firm, but at another bank as well. Hack was able to get a warrant for the records of those accounts from an unsurprisingly angry off-judge. When they presented the accounts to the judge, there were cash deposits which matched the taxes that had been paid. Hack also presented the judge with the copies of all the correspondence the insurance company had sent to Merritt, which she had never received. Based on the assurance that Martha had handled all the mail, the judge issued a search warrant and instructed the police to execute it on Martha's apartment. They were able to recover the insurance correspondence that Martha had saved in the greedy hope that she would somehow be able to collect on the policy. They also discovered the notices from the state showing that Martha had filed for adverse possession and had hidden it from Meredith. The judge referred the evidence to the DA recommending fraud charges be initiated against Martha. When the court imposed fines against Martha for withholding information about her investment and bank account from Discovery, Bobby argued that the accounts were merely overlooked because Martha had assured Bobby that the accounts were unrelated to her case. Hacks shook his head at how stupid Bobby was. He then drew out from Bobby a full admission that he had known about the accounts, but insisted again that they were unrelated to the case. The judge didn't think so. He referred Bobby and his firm, Strom and Deutsch, to the Bar Association. The judge noted that two junior partners in the firm were listed as associates in this case. Eventually, the Bar Association would sanction the firm, but would disbar Robert Garcia for willful malfeasance before disbarment. Bobby was surprised by a divorce petition from his wife stating adultery with Iva and Ernie as her reasons. Her lawyer, Habakkuk Jameson. While Garcia argued that there was no adultery, that Gloria and he had an open marriage, Hack countered that the marriage was open to participants with both partners, engaged his P.I. and secretly glorious, albeit unwelcome lover, had managed to play several cameras in their house with Gloria's permission, where not only were Ernie and Iva captured having sex with Bobby without Gloria's participation, but were captured talking about Bobby replacing Gloria with Iva while Bobby had been intrigued. He had never agreed, but the recordings confirmed that the three were engaged in activities without Gloria. Garcia's courtroom manner deteriorated during the proceedings in which he insisted on representing himself. By the end, his arguments would have been best described as whining, much to the irritation of the judge. That irritation showed in his decisions. At the end of the proceedings, Hack was able to garner 60% of their net worth for Gloria— as well as residents in their house for the next five years, after which Gloria had the option of buying out her husband or selling the house. Gloria would be entitled to 60% of any profit during those five years. Bobby would still be responsible for 50% of the household costs, including the mortgage. Should he fail to make those payments, they would be deducted from his 40% of the property, including interest. Hart felt that his revenge against Robert Garcia had been accomplished, especially when the order for disbarment was delivered the following week. Hack had some fun with Gloria, but found that sex without was hollow, and sex fueled by hate was depressing in the end. Although Gloria's end was nice and tight, he gave Gloria outright to the P.I., who fat, bald, and fifty couldn't believe his luck. He had never had a lover half as gorgeous as Gloria under threat of having criminal charges filed. Gloria agreed to a six-month sentence, during which time the P.I. owned her from five o'clock every session until twelve noon on Sunday. Gloria figured twenty-six sessions of abuse with the smelly man was better than years in prison. It was during the fifth weekend that the P.I. introduced Gloria to his friends. Epilogue. When Gloria's divorce decree was finalized, Eva found herself out on her. She had rejected Ernie when they had been fired, and now Ernie had thrown her out of his house. She began bed-surfing, staying with acquaintances who had dreamed of ducking her for years, but who would soon tire of the bitter bish who dug Ed well, but was unbelievably demanding outside the bedroom. She rarely lasted a month in the same bed with no money in the bank, and teaching denied her. Eva applied and was accepted in a management training program for a retail company. 
Eva hated the idea, the position obviously beneath her. But as she was running out of lovers who would offer her even temporary shelter, she needed the job to pay for an apartment, an apartment that made her college abode seem like mansions again. She cursed her husband for driving her to such depths. It was her fault. It was, she told herself as she drowned her sorrows in the cheapest whiskey that the dingy neighborhood bar had to offer. The seat next to her was suddenly filled with a large bearded man. How about a quick screw for dollar two hundred fifty ready to attack the man for his disrespect? It suddenly struck her that dollar two hundred fifty was more than her take home pay for two days' work. She appraised the man. How bad could it be? She hadn't gotten laid for several days. It could solve a lot of problems. She smiled back at the man when Jack brought the paperwork from XYZ for Meredith to fill out. She collapsed on the couch, sobbing. Jack and Ruby rushed to comfort her, had gathered her to his chest and comforted her as both Ruby and he tell her that she was okay, that it was a good thing. Meredith sat up, finding herself in her lap as she panted and finally managed to get out. Dollar two. Two million dollars. She hugged Ruby to her and pulled them both into her chest. I was so afraid. I had nothing. How could I take care of Ruby? We were so lost. She lay her head back against his chest, sitting quietly for several minutes. Then she threw her hands around her neck and passionately kissed her. You are hero, she whispered. It was a year later that Ruby was the flower girl, and Rosa, the matron of honor, has stood proudly as the vision that was Meredith floated down the aisle on the arm of his uncle, Howard James. He knew this was a woman who loved him. This was a woman that he was able to satisfy in bed, a woman who could raise the dead with her sexuality. God knows she raised him not just a second round, but quite often a third. His smile grew broader as he thought about the pleasure this woman brought to him. They were getting married just in time. Soon it would be obvious to everyone that Ruby would soon be a big sister. Opus. No, yes, I know that adverse possession requires a possession that is hostile to the true owner and that this can occur when the actual owner is residing with the claimant. But don't be discouraged. I'm sure you can find plenty of other things to pick apart here. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this essay, please like it and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to share regarding your or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.